our next speaker today, um, I have the privilege of introducing Larry Abel. Um, he's really a national authority on, on using data to drive policy and the redesign of academic programs. He's the director of the Institute for Academic Leadership at the State University System of Florida and provost at Florida State University, where they've improved retention and graduation rates through a strong commitment to data-driven actions and focused attention to details. He has demonstrated that success and progress requires many actions sustained over a long period of time. And I ask that you please join me in welcoming Larry to the stage. students and of course it's now about an hour and a half since we started and uh, that means you're going to be drifting off so if you feel free to grab some coffee or do something else the uh, I'm really glad to see student success teams here I can tell you that um, our student success team which we started in 1994 we began with representatives from the faculty senate council of dean some department faculty and over a very short period of time, everything that these students this morning said became apparent. And that it wasn't an issue of what faculty were doing. It wasn't an issue of the Council of Deans or the Senate. It was all of these other administrative issues, the scheduling of classes, how students registered, what was offered, that, were, that was really influencing it. And so our team ended up with registrar, admissions, and four frontline advisors, when I say frontline advisors, people who meet with students every single day because they know far more about what's going on than certainly any dean or definitely any provost. So over 16 years as provost, I had the opportunity for a lot of experiences, many of them like you sitting out there. And I have to say that sometimes when I was sitting out in the audience um, having to deal with another legislative mandate, I wasn't real happy. Um, I was the legislative liaison um, and to the Board of Governors, and I have to say over time I did learn to slow walk some of their demands. Um, the more faculty were unhappy, the slower I could walk it. So uh, <laughs> you have <laughs> some sympathy. The, uh, we really are gonna, we face um, four challenges really, um, and you, you see these everywhere. We have a, a low graduation rate, too much time to a degree, excess hours, and high costs. And I hope to show you today that there is a single solution that will serve to help alleviate each one of those. There's a lot of good news out there, and I'd like to focus on the good news, and that is um, institutions have a huge effect on graduation rate. This is uh, all publics with more than 200 entering students. And you can see that, say, you take a retention rate of, say, 70%, you can see graduation rates from about 23% to almost 60%. That's the good news. It would be terrible if they all fell on a single line and it didn't like well, there was any variation. You can take a little bit closer look at, um, let's see. Whoops. <laughs> Seems I shouldn't do that. Um, these are 12 Indiana four-year publics and 15 other institutions from around the country that clustered with Indiana institutions based on high school GPA, SAT, size of the institution, setting, expenditures. And the good news again is there's a lot of variation there, which means there's lots of opportunities for improvement. And it's going to take some paying attention to what institutions that are perhaps doing better and emulating those processes that will serve your campus. The other amazing thing, this is the percentage of students who graduated with over 110% of required credits. What is amazing to me is this is from the state of Florida. We have common course numbering. We have common prerequisites for majors, common everything. And you would think that there would be more consistency across the state. This is a huge data set. I think I pulled this one from about 16,000 students. You can see, if you think about it, it's a huge cost to those students. The more I looked at transcripts, the more I actually felt guilty that we were not intervening or intruding. I don't mind intruding 
um, more aggressively with these students. And I kind of, I was introduced to it. This is a random sample from last year from the state of Florida. Um, in 1999, I was planning our graduation and was trying to estimate, um, we wanted every student to walk across the state, so how many uh, graduations would we have to have? We were, work, we were doing Friday night, Saturday morning, Sunday afternoon. So I did something, I just said, how many students have, will have 120 hours at the end of this term? And I thought that would give me an idea of how many I expected to graduate. I, I was beyond shocked. We had 12,000 students with over 120 hours, and less than 4,000 of them had actually applied for graduation. We had 8,000 students with anywhere from 120 to 286 was the record. And what astonished me is if you look here, um, these are students who started at the same institution, and some of them had 254 hours. Transfer students, some had 269. Trans these are community college transfers, other institutions. The, it was just staggering. And then when I started looking in um, detail at transcripts, um, I, this is not you know, real common, but it's not rare either. There were 47 students in that sample that had over 200 hours. So I said, well, okay, well, let's pick one that actually graduated in four years, 220, 129 hours. And the cost difference, not just in total cost of tuition, room, and board is staggering. And then you look at all those years that that one student was not out in the job market Terrifyingly, these were engineering students. And I hope that I never drive over a bridge designed by the one on the map. Um, 52 credit hours in, um, in order to get through mathematics. 52. I mean, I think it's criminal that we allow them to go on this wall. Yeah. So I started looking in, at great detail in transcripts. And they really fell into roughly four categories. The double majors. I don't know about your institutions, but I've been really surprised that in 2000, about 3% of Florida State, or the state of Florida graduates were double majors. Now, at some institutions, it's over 20%. Uh, I don't understand why, but it's true nationally if you look around the country. The next group, I would call the churners. These are all academic terms. The churners were trying to get into a major that, say, required a 3.0 GPA. And they had a 275 or 28. And you can see the transcript. They go back and they start taking courses they think are easy to try and get it up to 3.0 and then get in that major. And what they end up with is 140, 150 credits, yet, but they're if they, in four years they haven't got the 3.0, another year or two is not going to get them there. And again, it's just struck me over and over again how guilty I felt that we were not intervening aggressively with those students. They were never going to get there. And the next group, um, I call them the triers. And they would try over and over again to pass a course. And you can see that 50% of these excess hours were the result of withdrawals, repeats, or fails. And these students, especially, they wanted to get into business. And that means they have to pass accounting and business calculus. And they would take three or four times, get through accounting, they get a C. Then they go to business calculus, the same thing. You know, if they get a C or a C minus, they're never going to finish a degree in finance or accounting. And yet, we allowed them over and over again to repeat these courses. Well, what can we do? One thing, I'm, I, I love intrusive advising. I like to intrude on their lives and let them know they need help. The, um, let's look at general ed requirements. You know, my first teaching job, I was like the biology department. I taught all the biology courses, and I advised in uh, all the arts and sciences students, a small campus. Every time I opened our catalog to look at general ed, I didn't even know what to do. We had over 200 courses to choose from in five areas, and at that time there were 46 requirements. I don't know how we can expect 
an 18 year old or a 17 or a 25 year old or a 40 year old to slug through this. And you, you probably may not be able to read it, but there's a diversity overlay you have to meet on top of the 39 hours here. It's really incomprehensible. You then can find some where um, the chemistry department and this university thought they were being helpful. They were going to list out some courses that you take. They don't tell you how many hours each course is. They don't tell you what general education they might require along with it and what the sequence is. Another university actually does a much better job. They, they laid out um, the chemistry courses that you should take and how you can put them together. But again, they don't tell you how many hours those courses are, how many hours a term, and how you fit both electives and general education into it. So what do you need? I thought when I did this the first time, and I had been um, almost psychotically focused on this for a while, um, I thought we didn't have enough seats for the students. And you, and you heard everything those students said rang so true. So the first thing we did is we did a very sophisticated program called Butts in Seats. How many butts <laughs> do we need for every class? And we monitored it in real time, we would open up sections, and what happened? Nothing. Nothing changed. Still excess hours, still drifting around. I thought, well, we have to make sure these students have a path. We need to give them an academic map. So we gave them an academic map, and almost nothing happened. They took it, they looked at it, I'm sure they filed it away somewhere. Only when we put an academic map together with milestones, with consequences, did it start to have a positive impact. You can't just put it out there and expect students to do it. Even with all the budget cuts, taxpayers, the public, is still paying a significant portion of a student's education. And I think that gives us a right to put some limits on the students. Plus, think about it. We have 500 or 1,000 PhDs on many campuses. And instead of having those experts decide the sequence and the courses a student needs, we let an 18-year-old who may have been drinking or smoking pot the night before <laughs> drift in, meet with some friends, and build a schedule. And you, you can look at transcripts. That's exactly what it looks like. So you need, they need a path, but they need barriers on that path. You know, if you go to the Grand Canyon, they don't just let you walk along the path. There's barriers to keep you on the path over and over again. It's not just the path, it's the barriers that keep that student on a path. Now you've heard that um, in Guided Pathways to Success, the consists of a lot of different programs. The program I'm going to talk about is Academic Maps. And that is a term-by-term, -term, clear sequence of courses with critical courses listed that must be completed in that particular term or other action they must apply for admission to a program, they must have a certain GPA, whatever it is that keeps that student on a path to graduate in four years. Now, people make this way more complicated. Our team, which consisted of myself and 10 others, mostly um, staff members on our campus, we decided that the faculty have already done this work because it's in the catalog. So, and I know from, you know, I was 20 years a full-time teacher. If you had come to me and said, build an academic map for your program, I would have said, do it yourself. I already put it in the catalog. You know, I would not have cooperated faculty member. So we decided, that, okay, let's, you know, do what we can do. So we then sat down. We could do 10 or 12 a day, you know, just in an afternoon and evening with pencil and paper. The advisors from that department were there. They would guide us along. Once we got it done, in hard copy, we send it to the department for their approval. And sometimes we would get back from the department and with a deadline. <laughs> um, because I, I knew that they had a curriculum meeting, we'd never see that document again. So we decided that um, we'd have a deadline, give it back in two weeks, or it's final. And a lot of departments said, well, you know, we change our curriculum a lot. And I'm a big fan of testing hypotheses. That's a testable hypothesis. So I did five years cluster analysis of every course offered in the department, and it was 99.8% identical year to year. 